Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in TNO, the last days of Europe, in which we're playing as a certain brotherhood of particular men. If you want to read about the country info for the for our good old nation here, go right ahead and as I'll slowly scroll down right here. But I decided to play as this brotherhood nation because it was highly recommended that I play it, and we are going to go down a very, very specific path regarding this brotherhood. Oh, hey. Cool. But regardless, let's start with our focus. Beneath the hooked cross. It is a sad fact that we stand far below our German <clears throat> masters. They rule over an empire that spans half of Europe. We barely rule over the city of Permheim and its surroundings. As far as we know, they likely either have no knowledge or are only vaguely aware of us. If we're to be loyal servants of the Reich, we must start by consolidating our control over the territories under our control and building the institutions of a proud <clears throat> Germanic nation. Every aspect of the state needs to be molded according to the Brotherhood Doctrine. We need more <clears throat> Aryans to run the government and military and more laborers and s slaves to work our factories. Our ideology needs to be clarified and applied to every part of life. With enough time and effort, we can build a nation that the Germans would be proud to witness. I really wonder if I can monetize this video. Well, I'll let you know tomorrow. Regardless, we are playing with a not super up-to-date nation, we'll say. Technology, technologically speaking, we're not going to be looking great. we got a whole four factories, we got five divisions, which isn't bad. But as any good old warlord, we got options and things to do. Uh, we're not really in a good position, though, really, to be honest with you. Let's go in and Lucas Otto. Yeah, he'd probably be good since he's a fortress buster and an engineer, and that's pretty useful. I'm going to put you right there, and I'm going to tell you what mods we're using besides TNO. Well, I guess right now, I'll tell you right now. We're using, obviously, TNO, Last of Europe. We're using colored events, play little piece conferences, which is the little b black bar up here, as well as play little piece conferences. No. Colored buttons? I think there's only four. Yeah. Play little piece conferences, state transfer tool mod, colored... Not colored buttons, colored events, and TNO. My apologies. My my mind is going wee right now as I'm recording this, but whatever. We have about 13 and three quarters thousand manpower not bad not great and we're mobilizing actually very cool we have a very uh, cult huh war sports are pretty low we have a lot of poverty but we need the hooked cross so let's go ahead bolstering our ranks a city on war footing instilling fear i don't like that because that lowers our stability let's go with bolstering our ranks although it is a fact born out of its definition the aryan is within but a few of us we acknowledge this sad perhaps inconvenient truth that the lesser peoples have no place amongst our ranks we look towards germany not with only not only with admiration but also envy with so many of the chosen people their con continent spanning empires destined to be eternal and without equal and the vastness of russia in its land and its folk we are but a mere moat of d dust this situation must be rectified Though they may be rare, there are Russians, just like ourselves, who are worthy in blood and deed to become one of us and ascend. However, these have not come to us befitting their worth, and we must seek them out in the silence of the night. When the bombers die down, we shall search for them. We shall take them forcibly if needed, for the blood yearns to rejoin with its kin. The search for the chosen, beneath the hooked cross, my friends. Ooh, the right of ascension, the Brotherhood's army composition is mixed between Aryan and non-Aryan. The Brotherhood can currently exert loose control over the non-Aryans in its territory, which, in this stage of Russian reunification. That's totally fine if we select this whole bunch. It doesn't really matter or anything like that. Adds a flat 1,500 manpower, an additional 500 manpower for each own state, strengthening the Brotherhood's control. Gain 2,500 manpower and extreme control over non-Aryans. Cool. Let's scavenge for loot. Beneath the hook's cross, as he was led to the ceremony room, Dmitry Polachev tried to calm his racing thoughts. He recalled wisdom from the doctrine. The mind had a hierarchy of thoughts just as a body had a hierarchy of blood. Fear, doubt, and anxiety. Anxiety were the brain patterns of vermin. Arians thought only of strength and courage, violence and conquest. Nervous nervousness was a vestige of inferiority he would soon leave behind. After what he felt like an eternity, he reached the end of the long corridor and entered the Grand Hall. Arians, members of the organization, sat in a horseshoe surrounding the center of the room, with a cloaked higher-ranking member on an elevated seat in the center. Dimitri dropped to his knees instinctively. Initiate Bolochev, rise. The hooded figure spoke in a soft voice that nevertheless carried throughout the chamber. He obeyed, attempting to mimic the dignified n figure of the Nordic ideal as he stood. He would perform admirably in the trial, serving with unflinching loyalty in all the duties of the initiate. Initiate, you have sworn the oaths to folk, rake, and fire. Uh, <clears throat> you have proven yourselves as one among the elect. Re revel in the worthiness of your blood, Matthias 
Gertzfeld. Welcome to the Aryan Brotherhood. The seated members clapped politely as Matthias received a proof of his superiority, a <clears throat> swastika pin, which he proudly attached to his lapel. His haughty posture and affection only for a few mi minutes before was now genuine. He felt pride and hatred pervade him to the bone. He was now a part of a small, elite class, high above the millions of vermin that filled Russia, and he would die before relinquishing that status. The Brotherhood gains another member. Nice. Very good. Very, very good. We need to build stuff. We need to raid... But I'm not sure if we can actually be super su successful raiding yet. Ooh, purified Aryan B. Nice. We need to own a lot of places to do that. But it's going to take quite a while for us actually to do well here because, well, we're starting a mission. The Reich's last conquest. Very cool. Political campaign. I do enjoy getting more stability because it's only 14%. And eventually we'll probably grab more war support as well. But it should be noted, we're not looking too good here. Our industrial expertise is slowly worsening, which is not good. We, our poverty rate is slowly worsening as well. And our literacy is slowly worsening as well. But we have the modern Bogatyr. Of all the tales of the Russian anarchy, there stands out one that has spread from the frozen lands of the Far East to the city of Kostroma in the West, and even into the deep lands of the Nazi Empire. The story of a wanderer who, who, from parts unknown who brings justice with them as they walk the desolate roads of old Russia. This wanderer has come to be one of the greatest enigmas in all of Russia. Little is known about this enigma. Some report they are a former ranger of the Euro Guard, a man who left his home to bring justice to the worst of Russia. Other tell tales of a former Wehrmacht soldier consumed by guilt and under a self-imposed exile as a penance to the people he wronged. A few scant reports tell of a widow from a destroyed village seeking to bring to others the justice she was denied. Whispers in the East speak of an American volunteer from the West Russian War. Stuck in a land not his own, but still doing good where he wandered. And in the bars of Siberian cities, one can always find strange and likely drug-induced tales of a man from the future coming back to save the world. And whatever their true identity and whatever the purpose in the corpse of the Soviet Union might be, all that is truly known is the kindness that they have shown to the people so used to violence and death. Tales are told of the wanderer holding off entire bandit raiding parties single-handedly, liberated slaves from Perm, tale of an angel of light freeing them from their shackles before disappearing into the night, and rumors have come even from Moscow of one-man raids on Nazi strongholds. In the end, while many of these deeds are undoubtedly fictitious, the actions of the hero, this modern-day bogatier, have lit a fire of hope in the hearts of even the most trampled upon Russia. An interesting, interesting story, if nothing else, of course. Oh boy, we got a lot of things to do here. And we definitely got to do a lot of this stuff. So I haven't told you yet, but this is my first campaign in TNO, you know, the new order, last season of Europe, with the update called Cutting Room Floor. This is my very first campaign using or with this update. So we'll see what happens. I'm not exactly sure what will happen, especially in Russia. I know a few, there might be a few more events in Russia compared to before, but we'll see what happens. I'm kind of interested in seeing what happens. Actually, do we even do anything for this? We're making guns, anti-tank. We're going to need some artillery. Mm, I'm calling it now. We're going to need some arty. Go and do that. There you go. I've got to get artillery on the guys to actually do well here. We're not even training any soldiers. You guys are 10 combat with, which is not bad. We're the Arisha Infantry Division. That's not great either. Actually, the Light Infantry, they use more equipment, but they have better soft attack. Defense, breakthrough. Ooh, uh, I'm going to use these guys anyways. We can't really afford them. Hey, but... Whoa! That... Hadrish is his successor? I have never seen that, but now I'm very, very interested in to see what happens. We're planning... Uh, what is that one? <laughs> Weekly War Sport does go up, which is not bad. Political campaigning, that's not worth it, in my opinion. Alright, let's go ahead and do the role of our race. The German bombers flew over our skies, a swastika proudly emblazoned on both of its wings. Beautiful airborne teachers that instruct the lesser peoples to know their place. That they find us unequal is no surprise. However... Despite the fact of our apparent superiority to the Untermensch, we are no closer to reaching the heights of our brethren in Germany. Germany! Instead, we wander, not knowing what path to pursue to enlighten ourselves. In our current state, the Fuhrer, the godly and divine being that commands the Germans, will look at us in contempt silent. To him, we are no different from the Russians, our perfection in being useless without guidance and destiny. He, like the plains above, offers no counsel nor advice. However, were he quietens, we must speak. The brotherhood shall gather, and all the words he sh said shall pave the road that we must walk. The search for the chosen. Dimitri's night was quiet. The Germans played and planes had stopped. In the woods where he lived, all was silent, save for the crackling of the campfire and the still whispering band of men sitting around it. The air stirred. He drew a long stretch of the cigarettes, watching the embers bloom and fade to gray. Along with the aroma of the tobacco, the images of home and family entered his mind, filling his thoughts in a gentle smoking haze. He took the cigarette, or he shook the cigarette gingerly and let its ashes dissipate into the wind. Warm and comfortable, he felt his eyelids sag and dozed off. He woke to the sound of the boots trampling throughout the forest. Some of the men had abandoned their places already, leaving behind whatever they 
taken to the secret place. In the distance, Dimitri could hear the faint arriving of a truck. Then the gunshots came. Men dressed in black uniforms emerged in the, into the clearing. He and the rest of the companions huddled together as the yoke of these men slowly wound themselves closer. Do not be alerted, he said in a voice, or he heard a voice say. Its owner strolled behind his men, his hands clasped behind his lip. Rejoice instead, for the Brotherhood has come to you this night to deliver neither death nor doom but hope. He paused, looking at Dimitri. He went closer, into the circle, and squatted down, gently running his fingers through Dimitri's rough cheeks and beard. I can feel that we are the same blood already, brother. He stood up, straightening, looking straight into Dimitri's eyes, and said, If you'd only still your shivers, then you would be worthy. Bending down, he put his palms on Dimitri's shoulders. But there's always an opportunity to improve. Now get up. He offered his hand, and Dimitri to grasp it without hesitation. Good, good brother, he said, swinging his arms around Dimitri's neck. Now follow us. He looked at the rest of the companions in contempt and said, liquidate the rest. Dimitri dared not look back, even as the screams ensued and ceased. The brotherhood grows. Very cool. Okay, so with this stuff, we're going to need more manpower, but what I want to try to get is more factories. Civilian, military, doesn't matter to me. Uh, obviously, it doesn't really matter right now since we can't even build anything up anyways, so... I'm really hoping for more military factories when we choose that option, but we'll see what happens. We'll definitely see what happens. Now, we have one loot. I'm kind of waiting for people to try to attack us. Let's see. We can do it against Vyatka, which is not a smart. The Euro League might be the best option since they're looking pretty darn weak. Zlataus and the Islamic Republic of these guys, so... It's not looking great. I guess we'll try these guys first because they're not looking great. Oh, wait. We have two loot. Wait, how did we get two loot? Okay, well, um, I'm going to go ahead and grab new industrial equipment first, because I think that one's just the best. Now, power tools is not going down. Actually, is anything else going down? No. Army professionals is going down, too, which really sucks, because we have locked in conscripts, which really sucks, which is almost god-awful. But, well, you know, whatever. Uh, I think the next one we'll probably grab is one of these three, probably basic literacy. How can poverty get even worse? Holy cow. Industrial base. Oh, my goodness. So if that's the case, repair against the Euro League. That's the. Oh, wait, we can't. Oh, we need more command power to do that. Cool, we'll probably do that then. Totally fine with me. Totally, totally fine. And then a warrior cast, an overseer cast. Let's see. Or a warrior cast. The Aryan drill. So because we want to go down a certain hyper. hyperborean route, well, at least with this campaign. We'll probably go with an overseer cast. The Persians of old, contemporaries of the Greeks, were Aryans in the purest sense. They were the people that etched their name upon a race. The forefathers began the great awakening of our kind. Yet, for all their fame and power, they seldom fought in the fields of battle. <coughs> Excuse me. Preferring to, to lord over their lesser peoples who would do their fighting for them. Their empire spanned from their homelands to the lands of the Jews and Arabs into Anatolia before finally being broken in Greece, the home of another chosen people. We wish to follow in their example. From now on, we shall only... Reluctantly fight, for the numbers of the Brotherhood are thin as it is. The people of Russia shall serve their new, better masters. Instead of warriors, we shall become overseers, and upon the shoulders of the Untermensch shall stand another empire, one stronger, greater than the old. Against fate, hail Wolfgang Alish. Welcome to the hall, enjoy yourself. The guard tipped down his head and returned Volk Wolfgang's papers. Do not cause too much trouble, the guard smirked and winked. Wolfgang gave the, gave the man his thanks and proceeded into the building, opening the door to the den of the beer hall with brothers young and old toasting each other while slave girls worked in the aisles of the tables carrying towering tankards of the thick sour brew. He picked a vacant seat and sat in it. He ordered a drink from a slave, addressing her curtly with them without affection. When it arrived, he did not even dine to thank her and took it without comment. While enjoying his pint, a group of boisterous young men barged through the doors, exchanging crude jokes with one another. They were men from his platoon. He waved at them to join him. Soon his table became crowded with comrades, brothers in arms, and with whom he shared his brightest bond. Far beyond reality, or far beyond family. That binds him deeper and thicker than mere blood. Quiet, quiet, order, order. Men shouted as they cleared the center of the hall, leaving a lone, red-faced man standing on a table, stumbling drunkenly side to side in an effort not to fall. His friends laughed at him, jeering him on to go on. He straightened his back, and making an earnest face, drew his breath. Comrades, brothers, countrymen, he started. Waving his arms wildly, he began his appeal without adornment nor ostentation, though without elegance nor punch. His words, railing against their inferiors, struck a chord with the crowd. His anger at a low station of the Aryans resonated with Wolfgang. He ended his tirade, saying, And this is what I suggest, brothers. A pooch, a pooch against fate. To rage against it, to burn out in the struggle. To rebel against our destiny and make it our own. The hall erupted in cheers. And Wolfgang found himself repeating the words, A pooch, a pooch against fate. Ooh, stability war sport. Don't mind if we do. 
Oh, all right. So this is pretty dangerous. We're going to try it. I don't know if we're going to be successful with this, but hopefully they say we give up. Are we losing weekly war support too? What is going on? No, it's just minus... Oh, it's because we're importing new industrial equipment. Well, that's not good. Yeah, I definitely want to get this one first. I'll focus on research. I mean, all this stuff is super important. Especially getting more manpower for us, but we'll see what happens. Actually, we're only making one division. Jesus. Well, hopefully with this, we can at least get another military factory. Hopefully. There's a 40% chance, but I'm going to risk it. Risk it immediately. Security control. Initiate raid. Okay, come on. Give it up. Come on. Give up. Go, give up. Give up. Give up. Come on. Come on. Tribute paid. Miraculously, Euro League has caved in and paid us tribute, handing over our desired loot from their state. Bloodshed has been avoided, and our men live to fight another day. It is unlikely that Euro League, though, is to surrender to us so easily. Again, threats are sometimes needed to survive in the anarchy of Russia. Beautiful. Now, I'm not sure who else we can take out, because fighting over River and Tovyatka, not a good idea. Uh, maybe against Latalus, but they... It's like mountains or hills up here, right? So, attacking into mountains, 40% attack. Oh, that hurts. That hurts. Oof. Islamic Republic now attacking over the water. Not a good idea, but that is probably our best bet compared to the Euro League. With the Euro League there. Oh, Field Marshal. Hello. Guthrum Wagner. Hello. Proof by deed. Oh, let's go with that. Arianism is strength, and thus only the strong are capable of being true Arians. This is the maximum we must live by if our nation is to avoid sinking into degeneracy. Separating the master race from the subhumans is therefore of paramount importance. And to achieve this end, we have developed an elaborate test of resolve. Anyone who can demonstrate their ability to kill or capture at least five people will have amply shown that they are fit to walk among us. Already we have discovered several dozens of the worthy. Using this method, some of whom were busy proving the Arianists, and well before we even rose to power. Henceforth, all prisoners we captured and deemed potentially suitable will be administered this test. If they pass, they will be permitted, permitted to join our ranks. If not, we will treat them as we do the rest of the Untermensch. The new overlords. This is, this is how you hold a gun, you idiot. The Aryan said to Mikhail, correcting the way he dispiritedly held the rifle before wrestling it away from him. Touching you disgusts me, he said, before striking Mikhail's stomach with a butt. It continued to, continued to show as Mikhail collapsed. Do that again, and I swear this time I'll shoot you dead. He threw the rifle down and turned towards a line of slaves gathered in the training grounds. The next one of you, Untermesh, who fails at this, I'll shoot one of you randomly. He drew a sidearm from his holster and disengaged its safety, pointing it at them. Mikhail's life was not always like this. He still remembered. When they came to take him, writhing in pain, or wreathing in pain, and clutching his stomach. He remembered the day when he, they had come to take him. Gunfire, screaming, the village burned, and its older inhabitants had put against the wall and shot. When arrived at Pernheim, the Brotherhood greeted him and his fellow captives. They divided the group into two, one for labor, one for war. The Brotherhood shepherded the latter out from the city, plainly dressed into the middle of the day, under watch from the sharpshooters. Stand up, how long will you lie there? The Aryan screamed at him. Mikhail got up slowly. Good, pick up that rifle and try again. Turning towards the slaves, he said, We have to teach you harshly, for you cannot understand. Mikhail shivered and held it straight, quickly this time against his shoulder. The Aryan wheeled around to find the muzzle of the gun pointed at his forehead. He heard a click and smirked. We are not stupid, you answered match. He drew his baton and struck Mikhail across his sternum. It beat Mikhail savagely, until he was black, blue, and, of course, bleeding. Sidearm drawn once again, he cocked it, aiming straight for Mikhail's head. He said, Listen and look, for this is your only example. The slaves looked away as a shot rang in the air. We must triumph at any cost. We we'll get more non-core manpower. We we'll lose division organization. We get more recruitable population. We get recruitable population factor, but we we'll lose 15% attack and recovery rate. Oh, oh, that's painful. That is mm. Mm, not boy. No. Regardless, we still must continue. A thousand manpower. I like the infrastructure. Consumer goods isn't bad, but right now we're out of this stuff. But that doesn't actually matter then. We gotta get more artillery, though. And we only have two. Oh my goodness, we need more of this. We need we need so much more of everything. Artillery is going to probably be the only saving grace we have to help us get at least a little bit more soft attack, though. At least in my mind. Maybe I'm wrong about this. I don't know. Very cool. I have tried this off screen a little bit in my own personal time, but that was actually a while ago compared to when I'm recording this now. So it's been a while. Proof by deed in 13 days. What do we have? The, oh, so we had that modifier we just saw. And then we have controls loose to build your sport. And then we have Luftwaffe terror bombing, which is not very nice. Hey, look at this. Part 2s are going up, though. Two a month. That's actually not bad. That's actually pretty good. I thought it used to be one a month, but okay. Well, we'll take it. Now let's get some more loot. I love loot. And now I'm hoping 
that someone tries to attack us, but with the light of hope. Andre could hardly remember his life outside the camp. It had been so long. Once, he knew they had been some sort of import among his peers. He had been a leader in a community with a wife and children, but his community had long since been profaned by the Nazi dudes that held him in thrall. As people murdered or enslaved, the sweet Alexandria had wor been worked to death only months into their imprisonment. Their children, proudly, proud Yuri and Shai Anna, had been murdered only weeks into their stay in this hellish landscape. However, he had survived the back-breaking labor, the starvation, the near-constant beatings and humiliation. On some days, it seems as though God himself had picked him to suffer as Job had. However, he had no delusions. Their story would end on a positive note as Job Andre dragged himself from the rack and trudged out of the slave barracks. It would be another long few days in the mine, and he felt that they would be his last. As Andre heft his pick, he heard a commotion from the direction of the guards' barracks. Suddenly, an explosion rang out. A fireball arose in the administration's building. In the aftermath of the explosion, a shot rang out, and the camp commandant's head exploded. Finally, the guards around the mine entrance started to rally themselves before they could get far. A group of slaves, armed with mining equipment, had descended upon them. Andre had not even realized he had joined them until he felt the pick pierce the nearest guard's skull. Then a voice pierced through the fog of war. Come on, you dogs, death to the uh, fascists. A group of partisans approached the mine, a man with a build of a woodsman at their head. And a strange man in a tattered uniform stood at his side, silent. Well, glad to see you poor slobs join in on the fun. Come, we're getting you out of here, all of you. With those words, some small hope returned to Andre's heart. The struggle for freedom has only just begun. You know, I was thinking with this. If we keep w just one loot... That could provoke the AI and trying to attack us over a river or through mountains, so uh, maybe that could be good. Maybe, maybe not. Proof by deed. The Ubermensch marched to war. Well, we can't do that since we already did the other one. An army of pure... I'd like to read about the Ubermensch. Go right ahead. The Uber dudes. An army of the pure dudes. Go right ahead. Guide the Uber Untermensch. The Aryan was made to rule, and our army will reflect this natural state of being. We will enlist the subservient races to do the bidding of their superiors, both to minimize our losses and to reduce the number of subhumans present in the world. We will dispatch recruiting parties throughout our territory, beginning and begin the enlistment of this father. Resistance from the populace is to be expected at first, but eventually they will give in to their servile instincts, especially after we've made examples of their friends and families. Soon we will have a horde of attack dogs waiting at the back and beck and call of their owners, ready to be unleashed on our enemies. A few have raised concerns about the idea of arming our slaves with weapons, but these are the baseless worries. Any unruliness within the ranks will be dealt with quickly and efficiently, and any revolts will be put down by more loyal units. And now we have a proof by deed. So, repeat after me, I swear to uphold the values of my race, to honor my ancestors with my every action, and to defend my nation to my dying breath. The hooded figure intoned these vows from his elevated seat in a deep, clear voice like the toll of a church bell. The two kneeling men, soon to be initiates into the Brotherhood, followed along dutifully. After several days of elaborate rituals, their entrance into the ranks of the master race was just minutes away. As they spoke, the recruiter looked each other over and made his judgments. The first was a lanky peasant with cold blue eyes and a cruel countenance. He was nothing more than a jumped-up farm boy out for blood, a thug, not an Aryan. The second man was far more intriguing. As far as anyone could tell, he was only a recent arrival to Permheim, pulled there inexorably by his vision of paradise. His zeal practically radiated off of him, and it was clear from his words that he was a talented speaker. The men, their oaths recited, waited patiently for the recruiter's next instructions. Rather than speaking, he pulled his revolver from his holster and drew it down, clattered onto the floor. Whichever one is worthy, kill your compatriot. Without hesitation, the outsider scrambled to the gun and fired around round of his partner's throat, the round abruptly cutting off his protests. As a dying man gurgled noisily on his own blood, the recruiter was over Enjoyed. He'd been right to see the newcomer's potential. Brother, congratulations, you are officially a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. With all privileges it entails, tell me, what is your name? Siegfried Schultz, and I intend to advance far into the Brotherhood's ranks. Talent has a way of revealing itself. An ultimatum, we have received an ultimatum from Beranitsky. They are demanding that we hand over a tribute of loot, or else they will raid us and take it away from us. We are at an impasse to decide. Do we decide to engage in confrontation with Beresniki? Possibly risking our men dying at the hands of our enemies, or do we instead stand down and cave in to their demands, giving them their desired loot, allowing their, our men to live another day to fight? Never. 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 They can pry it from their cold, dead hands. Cool. And a proof by deed. Ivan stood clutching his stomach in front of the rotted wood in the wooden building in which he and the rest of his unit were being imprisoned just three days ago. They'd numbered over a hundred. Now they're only twenty-four. They'd been captured in a raid launched by the so-called Aryans against Berezniki, and only surrendered once the ammunition had run out. Evidently, this had made an impression on the opposing commander, as instead of shooting them on the spot, he had chosen to escort them back to the Brotherhood's territory. Now, that very same commander stood before his assembled prisoners again and began speaking. 
It is lunchtime. As you may well know, and within our barracks, he gestured towards a considerably more well-kept structure behind him, we were serving hot food and water. Ivan perked up upon hearing this. He and his unit hadn't had so much as a breadcrumb to eat ever since he had been captured, and his only hydration had come from a leak in the roof during the rains of the previous night. Indeed, one was even able to see the faint outlines of a rib cages of several of his comrades. But good food, officer continued, it's something that only the worthy are deserving of. In the fighting three days ago, you all show that you had the potential for this worthiness, the potential for a being Aryan. Potential alone, however, is not enough. At this point, he drew and presented his pistol, a shoddily made copy of a German model. My proposition is simple. Any of you who can use this implement to kill five of your fellow fellows will have proven themselves Aryan enough to join us at the table immediately. Do not, he looked to the soldiers who stood at, the, at either side of him, try anything funny. Ivan considered the officer's words for a long time. After all, had not food and water been the reason he had joined the military of Berezniki in the first place? Then his mind wandered to his comrades, the friendships he had developed, how they had fought side by side to the last round. No, he thought, shaking his head. He wouldn't do it. At first, it seemed like his friends were of a similar mind, but after a moment had passed, one stepped forward and took the pistol. He was not strong enough. So, for shame. Let's go ahead and get... Oh, good lord, we need to raid the crap out of these... <clears throat> Untermensch. God, I hope I can monetize this video. Or at least not get demonetized, at least. But we'll see what happens. Alright, looks like we got enough. We will not back down so easily. Come on in, boys. See what you can do. Actually, maybe we can take some of our soldiers captive and uh, turn them into our own soldiers. Oh, they're attacking into... Oh, uh, we've pretty much won already. Yeah. I mean, these guys aren't great. Don't get me wrong. But, hey. Wagner. Ooh. I'm going to go with offensive, just because we're going to need more attack. And he's a field marshal, so he will be a field marshal again. So, all right, Teddy, let's see. Mm, focus on research. I like, I really like infrastructure. That might be really, really good for us. Let's political power, consumer goods. And we can't even use our consumer goods for factories anyways, so there's literally no point. So, train your troops, focus on research. Might as well do this now so we can get it done. So we don't have to do nearly as much later on. Oh, they're throwing in more divisions, I see. Yay. Oh, he's really good on attack. Wow. Very nice, my friends. we got a guy that intermentioned. When's the next research done? In a long time. And we're about to win, my friends. Ah, oh, victory is sweet. And our soldiers are getting more and more experience. Yeah. Oh, almost one army XP, too. Beautiful, my friends. The enemy is defeated. Recent reports have been sent in from an overwhelming victory against a recent party of raiding bandits. In a brutal standoff, they were decimated by our valiant defense forces, and now their bodies lie scattered and mutilated by war. With survivors dashing for cover and retreating into the misty frontiers, our soldiers chant songs of victory and heroism in the face of an invading Untermensch. The rush of blood defeat will certainly teach them a lesson about attacking the lands of the Aryan Brotherhood for years to come. Now, to cleaning up the corpses, I did this because I knew if we won, we would get more rifles, and that's exactly what we could use, no matter how garbage they might be. By hook or by crook, the subhuman is naturally obedient and docile, but there will always be a few who have within their heads delusional ideas of a rebellion. We must establish these troublemakers from our military and make sure that their absurd ideas cannot spread to more impressionable of our soldiers. Our Aryan commanders will therefore be granted overwhelming power over their men. Any disobedience will be met with summary execution. Underperforming units will be made to lead the charge. If traitors refuse to give themselves up, their comrades will be shot in their place. Loyalty will also be re recorded, or required, or rewarded, of course. Those soldiers that prove that they understand their place will be granted extra rations and basic medical care, if wounded before being sent back into the fight. Perhaps we will even discover a few Aryans among the rabble, and elevate them to their rightful position. Guiding the Untermensch, though, a rusting rifle, a bayonet, and a single clip of decades-old ammunition. Those were the implements he was expected to fight with. He knew he would die sooner than later, and there was no avoiding that. He had known it ever since they had come to this village, taken his food, and told him to join them if he wanted it back. That had been his last good meal. Now he was lucky to s if the slice of bread he received was only slightly stale. He contemplated deserting many times, but in the end always deciding against it. Where would he go? He had no idea where his village was or even if it existed. And what if the ones who considered him less than human caught wind of it? The fate of the last one who had openly voiced disobedience and sent a chill down his spine, he concluded that his only hope would be to surrender at the first chance he got. But even that seemed a remote possibility for all he knew. They would just shoot him on sight, or even worse, he would be immediately recaptured. He doubted whether he had even the ability to throw down his gun, given how thoroughly the idea that it should never leave his hands had beaten into him. 
And so he marched onwards, doing whatever his masters told him. He had accepted the arbitrary kicks and punches, the hateful rhetoric he was treated to on a near constant basis, the pain that now occupied every waking moment of his life. He was lost, and he knew it. No matter which direction he turned his he turned to, he would be greeted by only but suffering. All he could do was wait patiently for a death that seemed like it would never come. He is but one amongst thousands. Oh, flat 8,000. Nice. Oh, we can invest in this too. Let's go ahead and do... Ooh, which one do we need? So we need academic base, poverty, which we can't do. So, industrial expertise. So, workers or literacy. Ooh, let's do... Let's do schools. Yeah, that'd be better. Yeah, this is not looking good. Woof! Woof, 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 woof. Two a month, going down by 1.75. Oh, my goodness. Poverty? Po poverty? We don't believe in poverty around here. All right. Political campaigns, trainer troops... Research research is okay. 10% is not bad. It's okay. An ultimatum from Bashkiria. If you'd like to read about this one, go right ahead. But it's pretty much the exact same thing now. Uh, you shall be led by good old daddy Lucas Otto. And I believe this is Bashkurdistan. So I'm going to assume you guys are Bashkiria. Just because Vyatka is Vyatka. Oh, political campaigning. We get... Yeah, that's not good. Trainer troops. We get a thousand more manpower. That's really just okay. It's just... It's only a thousand. Improved computing machines? Yes, please. Don't mind if we do. Let's go and grab the next one, too. Advanced computing machines. That's will help. Just barely, though. Just barely. Hmm. I would like to do the right of ascension, though. <sighs> I print our troops. Research. When do you, If you guys play TNL, what do you normally chick, chick? click on for warlord development? Do you ever do war planning? Because it's not bad. You do get more weekly stability, which is... Or we, you lose weekly stability, but... We do get more weekly war spurt. So barely, barely, but you do get some more, which is not too bad. Do you guys ever choose Trainer Drapes? Trainer, I can't speak. I apologize. Train our troops. You know what? I don't want to do this. I'll get at least a little bit more stability. Or war support. War support. War support. There you go. All soldiers come in. We are defending across from a river, which is nice. Gabriel Shivalensbach. We're fighting against Kusimov. How many guns we got? Hey, we're good on artillery. We should be. We're only minus 80 infantry equipment. And it looks like we might just win very soon. But they're... Oh, hold on. Hold the phone. They got some motorized thrown in there, too. Oh, that is not good. Oh, do you have any upgrades immediately? Skirmisher? Probing attack? Can I... I guess I can't have anyone who has... Um... Scavenger. But hook or crook? Brazil wins, wins the World Cup final? I'm not sure we're doing, but the Brotherhood. With the direction that we have chosen for our armed forces finally seen through, we can now look towards employing this army both within our territory and abroad. Not only can we secure the hinterland from the roving bandits who seek to subvert our Brotherhood and destroy it from within, but also preparing for expansion. It's time to test the waters and probe our enemies' borders through raids of their fringe settlements. We will be able to secure captives and loot, as well as assess our new combat methods and improve them even further with practical experience. And in the upcoming struggle against the Slav, it is imperative we ensure that no matter what, our Aryan spirit remains a dominant guarding factor in our strategies. However, it's no secret that these strategies can and will be continuously improved for the glory of the Brotherhood by hook or crook. There was a certain pleasure in executing <clears throat> subhumans, as Sergeant felt. He was both purifying Russia and instilling discipline at the same time. Now another sat stealing or kneeling on the ground before him. His crime? Failing to show an area in the proper amount of respect. He was a pitiful creature, lanky and without a single hair on his head. Disposing of such a pathetic whelp wouldn't hurt the efficiency of his unit in the slightest. It was doubtful whether the thing could even serve as a decent, decent cannon fodder. Such was the surgeon's confidence that he hadn't even bothered to bind the hands of the one he was about to kill. That would prove to be his undoing, however. Just as the sergeant was drawing his pistol to the prisoner, having appeared only seconds before a slouch and docile shot up with a swiftness that left his captor stunned, taking advantage of this opening, the prisoner seized the pistol for himself, undid the safety, chambered it around, and then shoved the barrel beneath the chin of its owner. The sergeant's face, normally cool and collected, was twisted into a fit of rage. That a subhuman could threaten him like this, that a subhuman could steal his property. His thoughts were cut short by a single pull of the trigger that sent the insides of his head spewing into the air. His killer collapsed to the ground, having used up his last ounce of strength in the act. A smile was on his face as the guards riddled him with bullets as was surprised to find that he didn't feel any pain at all. That this act of defiance would cost the lives of ten more of his comrades never occurred to him. But you must ask yourself, was it worth it? Was it worth it? Maybe. But for me, absolutely. Oh, very nice. I love more divisions. Oh, we can purchase stuff too. The right of ascension. We can repair raid. We probably do against this Ooh, the Tell Republic. They're looking pretty thick over there, though. They're looking pretty well armed. Let's not piss those guys off. 
If anything, I would like to do it against Euroleague because they're looking pretty not healthy or weak. Ooh, if we could buy more infantry equipment, anti-tank is not bad. I'm going to risk this. Come on, Zotaus. Come on, people. And please don't lose here, too. Come on. We can do we can do well here, right? Zotaus equipment arrives. Men shout in the distance, retreating from the patch of trees and shrubbery handpicked by Colonel Utkin. That early morning, the few stars peeking through the rising sun's glare alongside the gentle falling snowflakes were not strong enough to pierce beauty. Through the grisly set of a blood-stained forest, as cloudy mists of Russian blood spread throughout the trees. There, deep within the Russian wilderness, Colonel Utkin found himself alive. His men? Alive. And every single would be marauder of his fine homestead and village on the run or lying dead in the snow. Everyone stood silent, taking in their first victory in months. Their first chance to make a stand against a Russian attacker who so, so greatly pillaged their lands for so long. The men threw down their rifles, hugged one another, and cheered to the heavens over the newfound victory against the murderous thieves who plagued them for so long. Colonel Utkin, however, took a moment to inspect their bodies. Boys, at least of which must have been 16. A primate for cadets before the rise of the Soviets, perhaps, but the cold, lifeless eyes reminded him of that day when Russia would war no longer. Cheers and cries greeted the party of guards as they entered their settlement once again, with some having tasted their first victory against the men who tore their land asunder for so long. However, whilst the rest of the men enjoyed family and taverns, Colonel Utkin made his way up to his office, readying himself to congratulate the man truly in charge of the victory. Spinning the rotary, Colonel Utkin awaited. Yes, Mayor Consul Dragunov, this is Colonel Utkin. I wish to report the lives you saved with your most recent transaction of our government. Excellente. Oh, <laughs> I doubt he would say excellente, but hey, you never know what you might, they might do in... Uh, Post-Soviet Russia. And this is not looking good for us. If you win, you get political power, stability, rifles. For the enemy, they lose the Civil Rights Act. A turning point in the history of the nation. Whoa. Oh, are we silly losing the class of the triumvirate? It's only a matter of time. Now we better not start losing there. That would be very good. We, if we win, they lose political power, manpower, stability, and war support. If you lose, there's a 33% chance for food stolen, garrison slaughtered, or damaged machinery. And they get loot. And that is just not good for us. Come on, come on, please, come on. Don't let, don't let us lose. They're, they're actually losing strength, which is great. I think we can still win. Oh, we have five factories. Oh, we have three? Not bad, not bad, but not bad, but not good. Not bad. Our industrial army. Instilling fear, let's wait to do that one. A city on war footing. The decline of the city of Pernheim mirrors to a great extent the decline of the Russian race over the years. Just as we, in ancient times, were a proud and powerful people, now laid low by insipid monarchy and degenerate communism. Pernheim was once the industrial center of the region, but it is now a shell of its former self, devastated by war and resource shortages. We know from doctrine and example of the Germans that the only path to rejuvenate a race addled by defeat and degeneracy is war, constant war, without end and against all around us. Pornheim too will be lifted up from the brink of the destruction by war. We need to put military preparation above all else. As many of our resources as possible will be moved over to producing weapons and munitions. This city will reach its salvation and the first steps will be a baptism by blood. That's getting kind of... That's getting kind of, you know, intense. They have three divisions attacking and yet they're barely losing. Oof! I don't like this. No, it's good. Actually, how much political power do we get? Hey, 16% stability. 13% war support, not bad. Can I scavenge loot yet? Nope. Mongolian Civil War, 66. Oh, we're slowly doing better. External investments, focus on research. Ooh, do we got something else? Oh yeah, there we go. Nice, go and do that. War in the desert, can we buy any more equipment? Not yet. Oh, hold on, we're about to win, we're about to win. Ooh, payments, nice. External investments, secure control. Yeah, let's get more stability, that'd be good. I don't mind losing stability, uh, political power for that. And it looks like we're about to when the enemy is defeated. If you'd like to read about this, go right ahead. But now to cleaning up the corpses. Not bad. Actually, Gabriel. Gabriel. I say Gabriel. Because I knew someone named Gabriel. Level 2. He's good in defense. Reconnaissance is not bad. But over a river, we probably want to do relatively okay. Well. It's time to do it again. Ooh, is that Taos? Euro League. Oh, they, they don't have any money. Or Treasure has at least one. They can't do it either. So, wait. They they tried to raid us, but they couldn't do their thingy. Huh. Okay. Well, whatever. I'd like to go against those guys, actually. I would do Berezniki. 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 Uh, how many more days for this? Not, not too many more days. Cool. Let's go read the next one, then. So, work for your life, work for your bread. I don't know which one it is. In happy and joyous life? Hmm. Work for your life. Uh, labor for your nation. 
Labor for your betters. That sounds like the one we should probably do then. So, a work for your life. For every day we neglect to reopen our factories, our chance to build a state even approaching the glory of the Reich gets further away. Permheim's industrial capacity has been severely diminished by the ravages of war. Our efforts to continue industrialized or industrial development have been derailed in part because of the unwillingness of the non aryan population to work while Permheim dies around them. These subhumans refuse to make sacrifices to save it. Perhaps we should force them. There are thousands of able bodied men and women of the lower castes throughout Permheim, more than enough to fulfill our industrial needs. Our raider squads usually put to work a Acquiring manpower outside of Permheim can be easily redirected within it. The lesser races are more than resources than men. Are more resources than men. Let us utilize every single one we have at our disposal. The decaying city. Dawn looms over Permheim, illuminating the cobbled roads and rotten smelling markets. Men and women dress in shabby rags, clamber out from their homes for a day's daily toil. Children play amidst quiet streets, laughing and keeping a watchful eye to the skies, dressed in faux fell growl. The men of the Brotherhood patrol the streets, and the men, the anti air emplacements around the city. The thump of the well shined boots and the young ones scurrying to the shadows of their timbre, more fearsome than any bomber could summon. In one dilapidated and abandoned corner of the city walks senior brother. Valdemar, alone and with his partner absent, writhing in bed, and during a fever, Waldemir paid his worry no heed. If the man is airy enough, he will recover. Besides, in his absence, no one would rat out his de dereliction in of duty. The choice to spend his free time, however, is not nearly as liberating. In the district he patrols, there's nothing but broken and shattered buildings and rats save for one squat and running down bar. Stepping into it, he hails the waiter. This bar is a shameful establishment, says Waldemar. I order a full cup of sour beer and be quick about it. The Brotherhood shall handle your payment. The owner, flush face, went to fetch a dusty tankard and wash it in dirty water. Valdemar sighs, no other choice. A few moments later, his drink would arrive, foaming at its rims. He did not dine to drink it. Meeting the owner's gaze, he said, You seem to be holding something in, Untermensch. Speak, slave, or forever hold your peace. The owner seemed struck and began, You people cannot do this to us. One day, the will of Russia will rise and crush you. Besides, are you also not Rush? He held up his hand. I've heard enough, he says. The Brotherhood has plans for us all, and you will not stop us. He stands up and spits into his pint. I, we will pay for this portion. He threw open the doors and stormed out. So much for a drinking day. Hey, political power from that. And worst part. Let's go through one more focus, focus, and then we shall probably conclude this first episode. We have got no, we have got, no, no, no. That's not good. We gotta wait for the people to raid. I mean, if they want to attack us, that's kind of fine with me. But because we got plenty of guns, which is not bad, even though I might consider adding on just a little, just a little bit more. But once we have enough oh, army XP, which we don't have enough yet. Oh, we got plenty of political power though. Look at that. Ooh, sign me up. Uh, I've got to risk it again. I gotta risk it. So we have a loot, and now we are prime a prime target for people to raid us. Hopefully they aren't successful, but we'll see what happens. We will definitely see what happens. We still can't build anything. Oh, that hurts. Oh, 122% construction speed. Oh my lord. Oh my goodness. But at least this is looking that's not bad. And this is going up at a rate by 0.5, so that is pretty nice. Research not bad. And ultimatum. Oh, you would like to try it again. Okay, well, good luck with that. Maybe we'll add more Untermensch to our army. The SMP holds on in Scotland. More of the same, it seems. Work for your life, though, my friends. Labor. <clears throat> for your betters. Dim lights, screeching metal, and harsh barking orders. These were known as the Aryan Three by the workers of the Permheim uh, Munitions Factory Number 12A. And that was considered to be an understatement of the true conditions of the factory, even without the uncomfortably long shifts that all workers were forced to take. The outdated machinery, utter lack of any safety hazards, and the Aryan Brotherhood's overseers, perhaps more akin to slave drivers, were all endemic to the all factories in the Permheim, which seemingly worked day and night to churn out weapons and munitions for the Aryan state. The treatment of workers who kneeled over, simply unable to go on, was monstrous. Being shot was lucky. And I want to read the event after the, the last focus, see what happens. And let's read this, and we shall conclude our episode. Never work, never ending. It was midnight. Permheim's residents got what they sleep they could, but one constant in their life before and after the new administration. Their apartments, barrack-styled subhuman housing, erected with little concern for its inhabitants, were cramped, cold, and austere. And yet they managed to rest. Russians were survivors after all. A knock at the door, three hard thumps of a hand, gloved hand on wood. Hundreds of doors, in fact, on apartments all over the city. A father rose, gingerly stepping over his sleeping children to answer. A young woman slowly crawled out from underneath her thin blanket, shaking out of a mixture of 
cold, fear and cold. An old man stood shivering with creaking limbs, stowed his book away from sight, and held his lantern close to his eyes as he crept to the door. Another knock, loud and harsh, threatened to break the door down with its violence, and the residents of Permheim quickened their pace. Finally, they opened the door. In each case, a wary homeowner came face to face with a rifle. Their eyes fearfully moved from the barrels of the gun to the chests and then the face of the users. These were Aryans in the pines, or the pins on their lapels, and the haughty look in their eyes, marking them out as their betters. They spoke tersely, unwilling to waste even words on their inferiors. Work detail now. Permheim's new laborers, stumbling in the dark, were marched silently to the factories at gunpoint. They worked ceaselessly, taking short breaks only for bread, and when the guards weren't looking, sleep. The last semblance of normality, normality in their lives had been stripped away from them, exchanged for endless labor in the name of Rek. Of the Rek. Work sets you free. Ooh, less cap, more growth and base. Cool. And I believe our soldiers are pretty much ready. Give them a little bit more time, and... We will not back down so easily, but I hope you enjoyed today's first episode. If you did, consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already. And I will see you tomorrow as we continue our long journey of promoting our brotherhood. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.